Hello, my name is Graham Park and welcome to another Creative Futures session where I talk to people who work in the creative industries in front of an online audience of students at Glendua University. Today, our special guest is a British actor who's appeared in Line of Duty, Black Mirror, Whitechapel, Misfits, Four Lions, Control, and a host of other TV shows and films. He's also a successful podcaster with his award-winning two-shot podcast. Please welcome Craig Parkinson. Hello, Craig. Good afternoon. How are you? Is everybody okay? Very, very well. And thank you very much uh, for joining us and talking to our students here at Glendale University in North East Wales. So we've got theatre students watching here. We've got uh, foundation students who are about to embark on a degree course in a few months time. So lots and lots of uh, people who are interested in what you've got to say. So first of all, let's as, as you say in your podcast, I'm going to quote you from your podcast. Oh, go on. <laughs> you, say, you say one of them, no rehearsal, we just dive right in. And that's what we're going to do here. You're from Blackpool. Yeah. Tell us a bit about your background and what led you to become an actor. Well, um, it all seemed to be a bit of a no-brainer for me. Um, it was all... I ever put all my energy into and my focus at school, um, not so much the other subjects. Um, English and history, yeah, but I think, you know, it's all, again, with everything in life, it's always about uh, your teacher and who's going to inspire you. Um, and I was lucky to have some great teachers growing up um, who sort of pointed me in the right direction of, of, of what I should be doing. Um, and the training that I was going to be needing further on down the line. Um, and growing up, there was always uh, the fabled Blackpool and File College that sadly is no longer, longer in uh, St Anne's. Uh, it had its campus there, and it was widely uh, regarded throughout the Northwest, and everybody knew that... Prior to going to drama school, if that was the route you were going to take, you, you would start off by um, getting some sort of foundation course or a BTEC course um, at Blackpool File College, because that's where, you know, that's where David Thewlis went. That's where John Sim went. That's where a lot of other sort of famous Northwest um, faces that, you know, would inspire me that I would see on the screen. I went, oh, God, so it is possible um, to, to come from where I've come from and and you know, hopefully get on the box or get on stage or... Do you think uh, growing up in a town like Blackpool, seaside resort, you know, showbiz town, mm. did that in inspire you or have an influence on, on the path you wanted to take? Yeah, it inspired me to get out as quick as I could, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, I and, and still to this, I mean, I've, ju I've just been lucky enough um, to get back filming after you know, such an awful year for, for, for everybody, um, all of us. Um, but our industry completely shut down. Um, and I've just been finished uh, a series uh, filming in Brighton, which is funny because I have such an aversion with seaside towns now. I mean, a lot of people who aren't from there love it and they, they see sort of the glitz and the showbiz and the glamour. And all I see is darkness. I see the, the real dark underbelly of, um, of Blackpool. You know, a lot of people see the top of the pier and the candy floss and the lights and the, the Ferris wheel. All I see is underneath the pier, the murkiness and the darkness and um, <laughs> the, the permanent no vacancy signs. That sounds very, very bleak, but that's, that's um, I suppose there's something quietly poetic um about a seaside town as well no no you're, you're right actually um i mean i i kind of familiar with that side of blackpool as well have, having dj'd there for for many many years so you can imagine oh, the side you can imagine the side of blackpool i've seen i can only but imagine yeah so um did you indeed go to drama school um i mean you say you got support from your um school teachers which which is mm. good um so did you go to drama school I did. Um, I did two years um, at, at Blackpool Fire College, like I said, and and it was it was a real great uh, foundation because going from um, school where I would do drama once a week, twice a week, if I was I was lucky, 
Um, I was just craving more uh, education um, and I needed to, to open my eyes a bit more to it all. So you go from drama school, uh, drama class once, twice a week, where you're surrounded by the majority of people were there to do two things, uh, to DOS because it was, uh, quote unquote, it was an easy class, uh, and to, you knew, you knew that there's going to be a lot of girls there. Um, <laughs> so th there, were, there was certain uh, lads that would join the, the drama class at school just so they could knock about with girls a bit more. Um, so you would go from that, and Blackpool Fire College was very different because you were starting sometimes at eight o'clock in the morning, and sometimes you were finishing nine, ten at night, and it was just full on, and you were surrounded by like-minded people. You know, 99% of people there, that's what they wanted to do, whether it was, um, you know, in, in you know on stage in front of the camera or behind the scenes. There was It was a, a great sort of mix. So I did two years there. And then I thought, right, well, I've got to get out of here now. I was striving to get out. I want more, um, more education, more training. So uh, I was very lucky. I was on, um, I was on the last year of being able to get a, a, a local authority grant to, to cover the extortionate fees um, that are drama school. Um, and there was, I got knocked back first. So I got my place. Um, at the first drama school that I auditioned to, and I just went, right, okay, I'm going there. Uh, because I had no frame of reference, you know, and auditioning for drama school still now is a, is, a, is a dear do, because if you're not, even if you are living in London, you've got to pay for an audition fee to the drama school, which I think now is probably between 40 and 50 pound. Uh, then you've got to think about your travel. Sometimes you have to overnight and, you know, it, it costs hundreds of pounds. Um, so, yeah, when I got knocked back for my grant, I thought, oh, well, that's it. It's over. There's no, there's no possible way um, that I could afford or I could borrow money to, to pay for, for three years of training. Um, but I got together with uh, my dad and my deputy head of my high school who was ve was a very big supporter of, of mine and, and is still to this day whenever um and he he lives just down the road from me now he lives in preston and i'm back in manchester um and whenever we do the podcast live he always comes to the live shows now and we still email we're still very much very close um so we wrote to our local mps and basically begged and pleaded uh, to get it overturned um and they did and i got i got uh, all my fees paid for, for drama school and then it was just a case of uh, finding the time to get a part-time job at drama school to cover everything else you know your rent and your food and uh, so, that's, that, so that's good so they obviously believed in you and believed in your talent um, and this, of course, this is a, this is pre-internet, pre-social media days. So that's 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 good work getting everyone lobbying everyone to help you out. Yeah, well, um, you know, I've always been uh, quite vocal. Uh, some would say quite gobby. I mean, if, <laughs> I'm, sure if, I'm sure if you speak to some of my old teachers at high school, um, I never shut up. You know, probably you know certainly for the wrong reasons in some classes. Um, but you know, now it's that's it's how I make my living. You know, I, if I'm you know, if I'm saying somebody else's words or I'm mean, so, other people, you know. So do you think being, okay, you said that you're gobby, so like you're kind of a, a typical gobby northerner, if you like. Has that helped you? I mean, shouting, here I am, and this is what I can do. Is that an important part of, of, of making it in your business? Um, I don't it's very competitive, it, isn't it? It is a very, yes, it's extremely competitive. But some, I think I've learned over the years uh, when to talk, and I think it's really important when to keep your mouth shut, um, because what we do, uh, it, it, you know, every day, I, I don't stop observing. We just sit and we observe life. I mean, you know, again, not so much this year, but um, to sit outside uh of a, a pub or a cafe and you're watching 
characters you're watching stories all the time you're watching an argument with a couple or and you start to make up backstories of these people and you know there's just characters all around that you take and you draw on um and there'll be sometimes you know you're doing a film or a tv program and you're you're trying to put together this character and there's maybe there's certain things that aren't working and you think and you go oh well I remember about a year ago and I saw a guy and he was just walking down the street um and he had it looked like he'd been in a fight that he lost and he was it was a fresh black eye and and you start to build sort of backstories of these people but everything that everything helps I mean what you're what you're thrown um, at, at, at drama school or, or at university, any sort of form of, of education might not be useful to you there and then. But what you do is you, uh, you know, you, you fill up your, your sort of your, your backpack of skills, so to speak. Um, and they're, they're always going to be there, but you might not need them five, six, 15 years down the line and then sometimes you, you just pull it out and you go oh my god I remember that that's this is that time that I need it and I never knew that I would need it but it's still Brilliant. there so you have to keep everything because you, so you, you just you just just file it away for future reference you absolutely it's exactly what you do yeah you file it away and you bring it out when and, and uh, you'll just never know when you need it and I think that's that's the and presumably line. it's not just it's not just observing people I mean in your business you must meet so many different characters whether it's at auditions or whether it's at parties or at pitches so presumably when you meet someone you might take something from a from a character that you meet as well yeah I mean yeah we're you know everybody steals from everybody you just you're just constantly taking it oh, oh I'll, I'll I'll nick that or someone said that or that's interesting or that doesn't sound like me but it could sound like somebody else so tell us about your your, your early days as an actor then so you, you you know you want to be an actor you go to drama school um what were your first roles was it television film theater <laughs> what was it you wanted to do what was it your first roles and how did you approach them well um I'll be perfectly honest I didn't know I, I really didn't know because I left, um, I started drama school in London. So I went from Blackpool to London, just on the border of turning 18. So I was still 17. Wow. Very, very, very young, very green. Um, didn't, didn't know anything, you know, and it was only when I graduated that I started, I think, growing up when I was 21. But I still didn't know what I wanted to, to, to really focus on. Um, and somebody gave me a bit of advice very early on, an older actor, uh, and they said, it's very important to know your limitations. Now, that sounds like a negative, but I, I don't see it like that. I see it as a complete positive because it's, because it's so competitive. You have to know right nobody's good at everything apart from if you're probably an old movie star like jimmy stewart who i believe could could do most things you can't so what you have to focus on is something that you believe you are better than um tom dick and harry who are, have been sent certain scripts as well um so that's what i was starting to learn so the education well, it still hasn't stopped, but it didn't stop then when I was 21. So I got offered. Now, bearing in mind, um, I, I, I certainly can't dance and I wouldn't call myself a singer. Um, I graduated from drama school and within a week I was rehearsing a musical in the West End. Um, wow. Completely out of my depth, con convinced that they'd got the wrong person or some CVs had been mixed up. So I basically uh, blagged nine months of being in a musical. What Work musical out. was it? It was, it was, it's a, it's a beautiful old French story called Martin Guerre. Um, okay. It's about a case of mistaken identity. It's, a, it's an amazing story. Great film with uh, Gerard Depardieu from, I think, mid 80s. Um, so they decided to turn that into a musical <laughs> and I was in it. Um, so I'd gone from working, uh, you know, part-time in 
Pizza Hut getting the orders wrong so I could take the pizza home to feed other student friends. It's a, it's a savvy. Brilliant. Um, and to, to earn in, what was I earning? I was earning something ridiculous like three, maybe 390 pounds a week. Now at 21, going from earning nothing to that, it just blew my mind. So I was earning great money at 21 years old, but I was also working out that this is not this is not for me. I cannot do this. I felt. Completely- did you learn? Did you did you do it? Did you learn to dance and do a bit of singing? Um, I learned a little bit of uh, stomping around, if you could call it that. I really tried my best uh, with the singing. Um, so I just kind of faked it uh, as much as I could. Um, and there was a lot of camaraderie. Look, there was a lot of fun times, don't get me wrong. But ev- I'm sure everybody knew in that cast that like, what's it? I mean, it, was, it wasn't, um, you know, everybody has that, that syndrome, that imposter syndrome. This was not that. This was quite clearly, I should not have been doing that job at all. But I did. Um, and you learned from it. I learned from it, yeah, not to ever do that again. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then I went to um, Regent's Park Open Air Theatre for a season there. So it's a big, big summer season. So you get to do two plays. And having said uh, never to do that again, you do two plays and you do a musical. And once you're in the, the ensemble, you're in the ensemble. So I got to do... Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, which um, I hadn't done professionally. I'd done it at parts at, at, at drama school, um, which was a lot of fun because it was it was it was playing flute and it was one of the mechanicals and it was great and it was kind of crazy and really funny. Um, and then we did Pirates of Penzance, uh, and much to do about nothing, and it was just a joy. It was an absolute joy season because you become. You become like an old school sort of Shakespearean troupe, uh, and you're all mucking together, and that was a great learning curve. It was a, it was a brilliant season. I really really enjoyed it, and from there, I started because it was a very because it was uh, a very funny part. Um, I started getting auditions in for certain little bits of comedy on television, so I started building up and as soon as I got in front of a camera and on and on the set and once the nerves uh were there but I was controlling the nerves I thought oh no this is this is where I belong this is this feels uh, kind of like home for want of a better word um and I just loved the cameras I loved the silence I loved the rehearsals I loved the fact that we could stop we could do it all again or we could try something a bit different it was completely different um to a you know a theatrical approach um, to a way of working, um, and I and I just completely fell in love with it. And, so so and, you so you decided TV and, and and film was the way to go. Do you still but do you still do theatre? I mean, how, when was the last time you did theatre? Very occasionally, uh, I try I try and do it. Uh, the last time I did it, actually, someone reminded me. Um, I did uh, Hangman, which was a play by Martin McDonough. Um, in the West End, yeah, five years ago, which was incredible, absolutely incredible. I thought, well, if I'm going to get back on stage, I want, I want a role that is substantial because it was only a three months run. I want a role that's substantial, but that I'm not going to get bored in. But also, I don't want anything huge uh, that might rock the boat. And my nerves and I might just crumble so I needed a happy medium um, and luckily then this play came along and Martin's had been a big fan of his plays and his films uh, Matthew Dunster who I knew of because he'd worked because he's from Oldham and he'd worked with a few of my friends at the Royal Exchange in Manchester um, and it was, yeah, it was just, it was a no-brainer. It was a brilliant, brilliant play. And I, I really, really enjoyed it. Tell us about uh, the audition process, because you, you mentioned auditions. So when you're unknown and you're starting out, you go to auditions, you must be nervous. Um, but the second part of this question is, everyone knows who Craig Parkinson is now. 
do you still have to audition or do people come to you because they want you specifically for a role? Um, it's, it really does depend. Uh, I've been very lucky uh, to have incredible roles offered to me uh, by directors who I really want to work with. And then sometimes, like, I mean, you know, a few weeks ago I had to, I had to audition for Sam Mendes, but like it's Sam Mendes. So you, you're going to have to sort of work with him and work. So it really does depend um, if it's something that I really want to do, uh, then I, of course I'll audition. Yeah. And I, I never mind reading. And it, I like the audition process. I, I and I used to love it. It doesn't. It, it still happens, not as much as as it used to at all, um, because you know I've been doing it twenty years, and I've, I, I like to think I've got a considerable body of work behind me. Um, but I like to meet the creators. I like to meet the director because what I always say to younger actors is, you've got to remember it's a two way thing. You're not going in there um, to be judged you're going in there as well. Yes, to show what you can do with this part and what your initial instincts are. Uh, but you want to know if there's complicity with, with the director you're working with because any great director won't just stand there and tell you what to do. They'll want, they'll want to work with you. It's a two-way thing. People forget that. Let, let me ask you, uh, again, a two-part two, two, two part question. Um, over the years, as you become more well-known, I, I think you play a good variety of characters that you could probably best describe as larger-than-life characters, right? Yeah. But there's one... I mean, I, I want to ask how you approach a character, but there's one character in particular that you played, and it was a, you played a real-life person who's sadly not with us anymore, and it's somebody that I knew really well, yeah. and it's something that I worked with for many years. I'm talking, of course, you played Tony Wilson mm. in the film, uh, the Joy Division film, Closer. Um, a control. How did you, how, I mean, did you ever meet Tony Wilson? How did you approach that? But how do you approach characters in general? Well, yeah, that is very different. When you're given the opportunity to um, portray a, a real life figure, there is a lot of responsibility, especially with somebody um, like Tony, who was and, and, you know, continues to be such an icon, certainly in the Northwest. I mean, this is somebody who I grew up with having my tea watching Granada Report. So he's, I, I really I knew who he was. And it was only as I got older and I got more into my music that I, uh, I, I've started to research him even more. This is years before um, the script of Control landed. But it, it was originally sent to me uh, to meet Anton uh, to possibly play Rob Gretton. Uh, that was originally what I went in to discuss. So, someone else that I know very well. Yeah, exactly. Very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we had a discussion and he said, well, actually, how would you feel about playing Tony so I had to completely rethink and reread the script again because the first time I read a script I try and read it as blank as possible without the character in mind or, or what I'm wanting or what they want me to do spring it out so the first time I read it as blank as possible to get a feel for the script then I'll go back and read it and you know the, the part will will jump out because that's what I'm focusing on for that time. So I had to go back and reread it with Tony in mind. And as I said, you know, there is a lot of responsibility there. Um, but it's something that I thought, it's something I, I didn't know whether I could do, if I'm honest, but I was convinced. And the more research I did, I thought, no, we can do something with this and we can portray him in a, in a very different way to a certain other film that had portrayed him in that way because this this wasn't um the story of tony wilson this was the story of, of ian ian curtis yeah so it was you know it was, it was we were going down a different avenue um and yes i did meet i did meet tony i met him a few times uh, he first came down onto set uh with the dogs and it was during it was during a live scene where uh, tony was introducing joy division i think for the first time on television 
um, and we had a little chat. And then I, I did meet him again in St. Anne's Square, actually, down the road, again, with the dogs. And it was after... Um, it was after we'd completed the film, but it wasn't out yet. Um, and of course, you know, Tony passed before um, the film was completed. Uh, but I'm aware that that his family um, enjoyed it, and and yeah. But as I say, it's about responsibility. So yeah, I I because I I like the way you did it because uh, I think you made a thinly veiled uh, reference to someone who. Did a great impression of Tony Wilson in another film. Yeah, but what? But you did an interpretation, and I and I knew that was Tony Wilson. I thought I thought I thought it was really good. Oh well, that's I, that's a high praise coming from you, James. <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. But I just wanted to tap into um, th the fact that he was such the wordsmith, you know, absolutely, um, and he and he really made things happen. And he so what go, about? What about other characters then? Fictional characters. Uh, mm. You get you get a script. How do you approach um, researching a character or, or putting your own take on a character? Well, I I uh, always go with my gut instinct first of all because that's where everything starts, um, and it's about reading, 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 reading as much as possible because the more, especially with uh, fantastically written scripts the first time you read it you've got your gut instincts you go okay yeah I understand that I, I'm putting that together I'm putting this together so you're building you're building the character you're building the jigsaw of who this character is um and the more times you read the more you see it's a bit like you know there's old sort of uh, um the magic eye um do you remember those see the more you look the more you see um, so it's just all about reading um, and trying things out uh, and failing miserably. And to fail miserably before you're in front of the camera is great, but you will fail in front of the camera as well. And then all of a sudden, you'll be, you'll be there filming a scene with somebody and somebody will say something and you hadn't interpreted that that was how it was going to be. And it sends you off on another path. So... Um, it, when you're there, it's it's always about listening. You have to listen, um, and oh, to the point that to the point that if you think you've got the character, and then suddenly when you're filming, the director's trying to say, "No, no, 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 that's not what I want to talk. Take another way." I, can you do that um, when you when you're actually filming? Yeah, yeah, you can. I mean that that would very. That, that that would very rarely happen to, to that to that extreme to go no 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 absolutely not because you would have ironed that out right, right. way before because you've got to remember uh, there's a, a huge crew that have been there long before you they've been setting up lights since five o'clock in the morning you've been given breakfast and had tea and you're <laughs> sat in your trailer that you're keeping warm yeah um, but it's. You know, it, again, it's what I spoke about before about the complicity with a director and a writer. It's all about having the character development discussions prior to getting on set. So then right. you're not wasting anybody's time because you don't, even though the days are very, very long, you may not have a lot of time to get a specific scene in. So if you've got those questions, get those out of the way first. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a big one for asking questions. I think it's very, very important. So um, which directors and actors uh, have you worked with that you really admire or have enjoyed working with the most? It's... Um, I get something from everybody. I really yeah. genuinely do, and that's, I'm not sort of sugarcoating that. Um, I love, I was doing an interview last week, actually, when we were talking about uh, first-time directors. I love working with, with new directors. Um, they bring such a focused energy the majority of the time. You know, they've been, they've been prepping their TV show or their film for years, especially if it's something that they've written and they've, it's self-financed. 
it's taken a long time to get here. So they know everything and they've got answers to all of your questions. Uh, and I love that. And also, especially with a low budget film, you may only have two or three weeks to film it. So again, we thought get all your questions out of the way because there is no time for that once you're filming because you hit the ground running, you've got to get it right. Um, God, I've been so lucky to... to I, I loved... I'll tell you what was a great education was working with Chris Morris, um, who is terrifying when you first meet him because, because there's such a... Um, not stigma, but there, there's a lot of myths about Chris because he doesn't do press. He doesn't do a lot of interviews. You don't really know anything about him. He's this person that comes on to your television screen, sometimes with no fanfare, will explode your television with um, his intellect and his humour and what he's bringing there. You've never seen anything like it before. And of course, you know, rags like the Daily Mail are all up in arms about certain things without ever having seen them. I remember um, I, when I was talking to him about getting uh, Four Lions, um, the budget for Four Lions, nobody would touch it because that one, they heard it was Chris Morris and two, they heard, this is without having read the script, they heard it could possibly be about suicide bombers and they went are you having a fucking laugh no way so he got turned down by everybody um and of course warp films um you know mark herbert warp they're very well known for you know breaking the rules and you know getting the sledgehammer exactly um, because... as a record label first of all they did that well, exactly and then yeah. as a media company yeah mm. and you In know fact, that but just before you go on about that, Sean, I've got a student here called Sean, and he's actually got a question about Four Lions. So just to interrupt you for one minute, Sean, are you there? Can you ask Craig your uh, Four yeah. Lions question? And then you can continue with your story, Sean. Uh, Hello. Craig, sorry. Hello. Sean. Uh, yeah, so um, obviously, as you said, about being suicide bombers, um, it's a bit controversial. Um, I just wondered, obviously, with the jokes, with any, was anyone on set or yourself um, ever just uncomfortable doing any scenes or behind the scenes um, or even after the fact, like in presses and stuff, did you ever feel sort of just like, I don't know how to answer that or should I be doing this? Well, no, not at all, because that's where I was going to come to, um, you know, you have to put your trust in a director and everybody had their trust in Chris uh, and Sam and Jesse who, um, you know, uh, you know, wrote the scripts Um and also the fact that we did the premiere for the film in Bradford. Um, and everybody who attended that premiere got it. They got what we were trying to, to say. Uh, we weren't, we, you know, we weren't poking fun in that way, what people would normally think we were. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was, they really got the heartfelt sort of message because it is kind of heartbreaking. You know, there's a, a lot of people were very moved by the end of it. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Sorry, I just got lost in the train of thought and I was really thinking about something. Yeah, I was, no, that, I was yeah, going back brilliant. through, through the film. <laughs> Thank, um, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Sean. Right. Uh, I, actually, Melissa has got a question that I think would uh, fit um, at the moment because you're talking about how controversial that film was and how, how difficult it was. Melissa, have you got uh, your question? For Craig, are you there, Melissa? Um, yeah. Here she is. Hello, Hello Melissa. Hello. Um, um, one of my questions was, um, how did you sort? Um, what was the hardest role you've done, and how did you sort of prepare for that, like, um, as the character and mentally and physically as well? Uh, do, do, uh, do you mean sort of just uh, over the years, what's been the most difficult part? Um, sort of, yeah. Yeah. Um, every project uh, worth the salt, the salt, the salt should <laughs> um, should have difficulties. I think it should have bumps in the road. Um, I think if if things are too easy, or if things are too easy, you're going to be bored. Um, and I and I, it was like I was saying 
to Graham before about taking on the role of Tony Wilson, uh, my initial thought was, oh, well, I don't know whether I could do it. That's kind of terrifying. That's exactly the reason why you should be taken apart. Um, like I, I was talking to a director on Zoom yesterday about a possible project in January, and we were going through some scenes, and I was saying to him, and it was it's it's a brilliant, brilliantly written script, and it was I was approaching something from a wrong angle, and I said to I said to him, I said, I said, Mark, I, I, this is a problem scene for me, not the way it's written, uh, the way that I'm approaching it. I don't want to portray this uh, with any um, sentimentality at all uh, but I feel I am when I've been looking at it and I don't so I, I find that hard so I think it's all right to say you, that you find something hard I think things should be difficult anything worth doing well I think should be a little bit difficult should be a challenge um, but you should also try and find the fun aspect in things does that make sense yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Thanks. Melissa. Thank you. That made me think of a couple of questions, Craig. Um, mm -hmm. You've been part of TV shows that have become famous, mm -hmm. but you've also had roles in TV shows that are already famous. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking, for example, uh, when you appeared in Line of Duty, that was already an established show. Um, what's the difference in, in, in a, being part of a show that from the start and joining something that's already famous and having to slot into to work with characters already established? Um, there, there's something uh, exciting about both. Um, now, when you're creating a show from scratch, uh, you're also creating that character from scratch. And also the writers are still working things out. So by the time you're on, say, a third series of something, they, they the writers write for you. They write for that character because they know that you've you've all created that world together. So I remember um, I was starting a see a new Channel Four period drama that we were shooting in Malaysia a few years ago, which was doubling for. Uh, period India and we couldn't shoot in India because it was too built up it was too modern so we had to um, go to Malaysia for six months and the first series we were just ironing things out and it was very it was very dramatic it was very it had hints of you know Jewel and the Crown it had that sort of aspect to it but the writers were still working things out and I remember being sent the first few episodes of the second season and I started reading it, and there was my character. And yes, it said his name on the page, but what he was coming out with, I was going, that doesn't sound like the character at all. And it, and it was a bit like the control and responsibility of the writers had been taken away from them, and it had been written by committee or, or, or some sort of weird algorithm. It didn't sound like it, so you can see it on the page because you've created that character. Um, uh, but then I was blown up halfway through series two, so I didn't really matter. <laughs> um, but it's funny when things like that jump out. Um, but th there's a lovely joy and excitement of building something from scratch. Um, and I think what is very dangerous is that you should never, as good as something is, or you go into things with the best uh, will in the world and the best intentions, you should never congratulate yourself or pat yourself on the back by thinking, oh, we've got a, a, a big hit on our hands here because that is, uh, you're on a downward spiral there and that's not what you should be getting into this for. Um, you should just, you know, like let's, let's case in point with the first series of Line of Duty, we knew we had a great cast. We had fantastic scripts. And it, became, it was a bit of a cult show at first. It was on BBC Two, nine o'clock on a Tuesday, I think. And it was only when Series Two happened, and that kind of blew up, that people started to go back and rediscover Series One. So people watched things out of order. Um, when you're going into an established show, 
or you're going in to guest on, on, on a, an established show. Um, the weight and responsibility uh, is still there for you as an actor because you, you're there, you've, you know, you've been employed to do what you do and do your job to the best of your ability as across the board with everything. But there is less of a weight um, because you already know that there is an audience. There is an audience for something and you have to go in and slot in. Uh, now, sometimes it's quite difficult and really nerve wracking especially if you're going in to guest um, on, on a, such a well-established series. I, I, just, um, I can't really think of a case in point, but you, you kind of know those shows. Um, but you, you do get more nervous because you're thinking, well, that's, that's their world. I, I have to now um, slot into their world. And the, the certain, sometimes the certain paces of shows that are very fast paced and every talks a certain way because that's the tone of the show. And maybe that's not how you work or how you see the character, but you've got a slot into it. So um, the responsibility shifts and, it's, and it changes. I suppose with everything, the one thing that you always should strive to be uh, is to be adaptable. And that's why you know, you have to be adaptable to the world that you're going into and also be adaptable to, to work with a director, especially if you're doing a series because you'll do, say if you're doing a six part series, it'll be split up into two blocks. So one director will uh, direct the first three and the second director will do four, five and six. Now those two directors, uh, of course, they're creating the world that you're, that you're living in, but they will work in a very, very different way to each other. So you have to keep listening and, and adaptable. And I think that's another reason why it's important sometimes to stop and listen and keep your mouth shut. Can, can I can I ask you about Lady Duty? Were you disappointed yeah. that your character got killed off? Mm -hmm. And did you know it was going to get killed off or did you just turn the page on the script and saw that you um, got killed off? No, I, I, I couldn't have... I couldn't have uh, asked for a better exit it was, it was it good was it was great it was incredible and i think he had he had to go it was the right time for him to go it would have been it would have uh it would have been quite ludicrous i think to carry on um more because he'd been doing this for three se three seasons so it's, it's a long time to be pulling the wool over people's eyes um and i didn't i, I didn't know we because jed jed wasn't sure who was going. Uh, there was a point that uh, Martin Comston's character, Steve, was gonna was gonna have it. Um, wow. And it was halfway through because the way Jed writes, because no one else, I don't think no one else can really write uh, the way that Jed writes drama on television. Certainly not in in the line of duty format he writes alone so scripts take time so when you start a season you get the first three and you devour those and you're going all i want is the next three i need to know what happens because it's it's you know it really is such a page turner and it's it kind of breaks you for a lot of other dramas after <laughs> because not everything is is of that standard um so you i didn't know, I didn't know for, for quite a while you mentioned Martin there, um, mm -hmm. who does a great uh, Southern accent for a, yes. for, a, for someone with such a strong uh, Glaswegian accent. Do you do accents? Um, I do. Yeah, when when I'm called for, um, then you know you just just doing like I was discussing with the director just yesterday whether this a certain character that I may or may not be playing early next year should be from the north. Uh, or he should be from Liverpool, uh, but that's just things that are, are up in the air. Um, but originally, I had to put on an accent because uh, I auditioned for Steve. It was me and Martin. I think we went in after each other because we're wow. really good friends in real life. So we met um, at the pub that was near where they were auditioning Line of Duty. And we both went over the scenes for each other and both took turns in playing Steve, wow. which was... 
incredible, you know, to have that. And there's never been, there's never been that. Uh, there's all, there's always been a support thing between me and Martin and a lot of other sort of actor friends. Is that a generational thing? Because it's because like, um, what are you in your late forties? Are you? I'm Mid-40s. 43, but thanks. That's what I meant. <laughs> That's what I meant. 1976. Yeah, Six. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, that's so there's a lot of great actors in your generation, right? That because a lot of them you talk to in your podcast, which we'll come to later. Yeah. Is there that is there that camaraderie amongst you? Do, do you support each other? Because yeah, because I... inevitably with the northern the, the range of actors who are generically northern there must be a bit of healthy competition there as well there is but you know you want to work you want to work with the best people you can because that raises your game um and it ceases to be competition it's just about learning you know that's the one of the great things about um this profession is you never stop learning because you never you never stop being surprised by who you work with um, but there was a, just going back to accents, there was, and still is, it still comes back around. Um, when Paul Abbott, uh, Jimmy McGovern were, and still are, you know, high points in television, there was, it was very, very fashionable um, to be Northern and to be from the Northwest, um, you know, where, you know, you had things like the lakes and you had clocking off. And then of course you had shameless. So I was just constantly asked to be Northern. So I've just sort of, I just carry on being a professional Northerner, which I, I'm more than happy to do. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, it, um, you just sort of, again, it's just about being adaptable and what, what people need. Um, I had a script come through last week that wasn't helpful it's not helpful when they say this. Uh, they just said, uh, we, we'd love you to do this in, in a general American. Now, that is like saying, uh, you know, a general United Kingdom. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, if you're going to say, I'd like it, I'd like this character to be portrayed from Chicago or Boston or the Bronx or California, then that, that you've got, I think people have to be a bit more specific than that because that's how, uh, us as actors, that's how we, we would do our research. You know, okay. Um, just let's just move sideways for a minute because um, you're, you're very you're very successful and busy and have been for many years. But somehow, in amongst all this, you find the time to come up with an award winning podcast, the Two Shot Podcast. Now, some of the guests, I mean, some of the guests are from that northern um, mm. acting heritage because you've yeah. had like um, Jodie Comer, Reese Shearsmith, Samantha Moore, and Art Malik. But you've also spoken to Nicole Kidman as well. Mm. Now, did, did you come up with the idea for the podcast and then go and uh, get guests, or did you just think all these get all these people I hang out with, I want to talk to them in a podcast? How how did you come up with the idea? Um, it came about uh, it came about when I hit forty, and I was devouring a lot of podcasts. Uh, a lot of interview, long form interview based podcasts. And there was a lot of them that I didn't particularly like. And I like people. I'm very curious about people. Um, and I think curiosity uh, is, is healthy. It, it's certainly in my line of work. Uh, and I'm fascinated with people. Uh, not so much um, showbiz, actory anecdotes, because I think that becomes repetitive and, and boring very, very quickly. No, I have to, I have to say that you're absolutely right because I, I listened to a few and I, I just love the fact you're very, very laid back and very relaxed with your questions. And it's not at all lovey, if you know what I mean. There's none of that going on. No. Uh, Max, who's one of our uh, foundation year students, um, he, I think he's got a question for you regarding podcasts because Max, along with other foundation students, are actually making a podcast as part of a, an assignment. So, Max, are you there for a, a podcast question for, for Craig? Hello. Max. Um, hi. Hi. Um, 
What was it that drew you towards uh, having your own podcast and how were you able to develop your skills at being a host? And by that, I mean, you know, how were you able to sound just so naturally cool and laid back when you were, when you were, when you interview people? Well, um, at first I wasn't, um, I wanted to do it because I, I generally wanted to develop a new skill. That's what I really wanted to do. Now, um, so I had the idea of a long form interview based podcast that only had two rules that because I'd heard other long form interviewers and what they sometimes tend to do is they turn the conversation back around and onto themselves. And I find that uh, quite narcissistic. I don't like it. And it, it, it kind of upsets me um, as an audience member. So that was one rule that it, it, it would never come back and turn around me. And I had the long, the long plan that I would start off with, with, with actors and certainly actors that, that, that I knew. Um, but I wanted a range of creative people from poets to musicians to chefs, uh, so, so lots of things that I was interested in, but it was all about the human aspect. Now, there was one thing that I was always very, very bad at. I'm, I'm only starting to get better at it now and it's press. So when you finish um, a job, you're, when you finish filming, the job takes a break because it goes into the edit and all those skillful people put the show together and make it all gorgeous and try and make you look half decent when you're acting, right? And then what you have to do is your job is you have to go, you have to go and do live television. You have to go and do this morning. You have to sit there and you have to be yourself. And that is terrifying for an actor. And also you have to talk about the project and they're ask, generally they're asking the same questions and you might do um, 10 radio interviews in the space of like one hour. Uh, and then you have to go to this morning, you have to go and do this. And it's, it's, it's awful. It's, it's a real nerve wracking thing. Um, so I wanted to see if I could be myself, but put myself in, in an interviewer's shoes. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. And I thought the first thing I'll, I'll do is, is get a good friend on. But it's very rare, I suppose, when you think about it now. I mean, I'm sure you, you, this is, you, know, you can answer this question. You know, with a good friend, how often do you sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk about them and put the spotlight on that person and talk about their past and their childhood and their failures and the, the history of their life. You don't get to do it. You don't get that, um, that experience. And it's an absolute joyous thing because even with like really good friends that I've had on over the course of, of an hour or however long it's going to be, there's certain things, and I may have known this person for, you know, five, 10, 15 years, I've never found that out. So it's, it's, it's interesting when you turn the spotlight on someone uh, that, you, that you educate yourself and you start to learn about that other person. So it just always had to be about the, the human aspect. Brilliant. Um, really. Thank okay. Thank you for that, Max. Good question. Thank you. Craig. Um, thank you. Are there any, Craig, are there any uh, people you would absolutely love? I mean, I know you've had Nicole Kidman on. Are there any, people that you'd absolutely love to get on your podcast there's loads there's a, there's a huge list of people uh, and they change all the time um and it's it's interesting because this year's thrown up so many potholes for for everybody for all of us um and there's been certain people that i've been talking to for like for the past year uh, trying to organize to come on and I've gone right I've got some free time now how are you doing they went well I've got free time but I feel quite vulnerable at the moment I don't really feel that I, 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 I'm fit enough um, mentally to sort of come on and because and, 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 it can be quite exposing Graham do you know no, I, I get that because normally when we do these creative future sessions um, we try and invite people to come to the university and i chat to them in person in the tv studio but due to the pandemic and covid a lot of stuff's moved online so sure. 
uh, it's actually turned into an opportunity because people like yourself who might not be able to come to North Wales are agreeing to to talk to us. So um, I'm going to expand the online stuff next year, but it's different talking to someone online. So I, would, I'm, I'm guessing you much prefer sitting to, in the same room face to face. Oh, but absolutely. You, but how, but how, what have you yeah. learned about interviewing people online and how have you had to adapt? Um, <clears throat> I try I'll tell you what, the f I, I recorded one very early on in lockdown part one. Um, and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I found it very, very difficult to get a flow on with the conversation because if you're, you know, you know yourself, if you're there and someone's right in front of you, what I've learned as an interviewer is if we're going in a certain direction of conversation or we're digging something up from somebody's past, I can see, I can actually see if they're willing to go there or not. And mm -hmm. so that's my job um, to look after that and look after them and keep that in a safe environment. Um, and it, it, it's, it's much, much harder to do that. No, uh, it, is. it is. Over the internet. Yeah. Um, so actually, yeah. Be learning. No, you're right. Actually. And, and of course, it stops people throwing things at each other if you get their age wrong as well. Exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I generally don't give a shit. By the way, that was. No, I don't. Know. I'm, only, I'm, I'm, I'm only kidding. Um, so, asking about guests you'd like to get. What about going back to acting? Are there any roles that you'd really like to do as an actor? And going back to age, as you get older, mm. are there roles that you might want to do? in the future no i mean it's 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 interesting you know every a, a lot of actors would say oh you know i can't wait to to get to the age where i can you know rock my king lear at the old vic and it, it's not like that for me i mean i'm constantly when i get sent things i go oh my god this is the part this is the part i want to play uh, so i'm constantly surprised I'm constantly, I mean, there's certain, you know, I'll, I'll read books or I'll listen to certain stories and I think, oh God, that would make a, a lovely film. I'd quite like to do that. It's more about genres. You know, I, I mean, I started off after um, being at Regent's Park, I was dipping my toe in comedy. So I would go and do a little bit, an episode of Black Books and a, an episode of this. And I was very much sort of on the comedy ladder for a long time and, and couldn't get a look into drama. Um, and then somebody dropped out of, or is actually a really good friend of mine who dropped out of um, doing the role in Whitechapel. And then it came to my door. I, I don't know how it did because I wasn't known for, for drama at all. And that was kind of my first real dramatic role. And also to be playing twins, it's like, right, okay, well, I'm not gonna get to do this. Uh, again so I kind of bit their hand off um, and now it's very difficult to get back into the comedy world because I've been doing so much drama um, and, and sometimes very you know intense drama um, you know and if I'm being directed by someone like Samantha Morton and it always comes from uh, uh, sometimes uh, you know autobiographical place and you know things are again you know I spoke about um trust and responsibility I and mean, if you're dealing with somebody else's story things can get quite dark so to get back into comedy I suppose the roundabout way is uh no there isn't really role but I, I comedy is I'm such a comedy nerd like I love the history of comedy and I I know a lot I think I know a lot about um a lot about comedy and how it all works um so i think i'd probably like to just get back to doing comedy at some point <laughs> if, if i'm trusted uh, with it well here's i've got another question here from uh about roles uh, yeah and a, and a very specific role actually hmm. i've got a question from another one of the foundation students called paul paul are you there for your um question for craig are you there paul Paul, are you on mute? Well, I, I mean, okay. 
I've got Paul, Paul, unless Paul suddenly pops up, I've got Paul's question. Okay. It, which was, um, <laughs> would you ever consider playing Doctor Who? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yes, yes. I, 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 it w would be something that, that I would I would consider. Yeah. It is, it is um, the short answer to your question. Who, who was your first doctor there, by the way? The one that you. My first doctor would uh, be Tom Baker. Tom Baker, yeah. But I was Patrick. never, I was never um, a diehard um, Doctor Who fan, really. I mean, I've, I've got back into it over the years um, because my son is nine and a half. And oh, right, okay. Yeah. He, uh, he loves it. And I love the fact that Jody is kind of his doctor. And I think, right. it's, on, yeah. I think it's so important to have somebody, uh, not just because she's a brilliant person and she's a brilliant actor, but she's got such great energy as the doctor. You know, we spoke before about you stepping into a world where the energy ramps up. So you think fast, you talk fast, you act fast, and that's what you have to do. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not, being flippant when I'm just saying, oh, you talk fast and act fast. There's a lot more skill to it than that. But what she brings to it is something that you have to jump on board with. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and I think what she's created and what uh, her and Chris Chibnall and everybody else have created is, is, is exceptional. A lot of fun. Good, good. All right. Well, that's, that, was, that was Paul's question. Um, now, we, we, time's getting on. So let me um, ask you about agents. Um, one, do you have an agent? Is it an agent you've had a long-term relationship with or have you had many agents? And also, how important, even for someone like yourself, but maybe for up-and-coming actors, how important is an online presence today? Well, we'll go to the agent part of the question first. Um, uh, you need an agent. It's essential. Um, you need a good agent. Um, I've had I'm on my sixth wow. sixth agent in twenty twenty two years. That's um, that's an agent every four years. I like to mix it around a bit. Okay. No, the um there's certain things um why I've moved. So my first agent just didn't re it was the agent I got straight out of drama school and as I said you know I was in a musical this wasn't the right path for me so therefore that wasn't the right agent for me lovely guy brilliant at his job but not for me so then when I started doing telly I moved to uh, a newer agency uh, and we worked together for a few years and then I just felt like I needed more so it's like you you, you need to be pushed it's like what I was saying about um a complicity that you have with a director you need that with an agent because you're speaking you know I speak to my agent you know sometimes three or four times a day you have to have a, a relationship with them and it has to be an, an honest relationship um, and I'm very lucky now I've been with my new agent for coming up this is the third year and it's like we've 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 been working together forever I mean, it's a very, very easy but exciting working relationship. Um, okay. And the only reason I left my old agency was uh, they kind of disbanded and, and collapsed. Um, and we'd been together for a long time. And it, essentially, sometimes things just run their course. They just, that person was there. You were working with that person for a certain period of your life. And it just doesn't continue. It doesn't always continue. Um, and, and I think that's healthy, you know? It's like, it's like certain relationships and friends, people come into your life for a certain amount of time and they're there to, to facilitate one thing or a few things at a certain moment in your life and then they're gone. But, you know, you're, you're a richer person for having those people in your life. What, um, about, what about online stuff? I, um, I know you're on Twitter. But I can't find a Craig Parkinson website, whereas a lot of actors do these days have their own website. So what's your view on, first of all, a website, but secondly, how important is an online presence? 
Um, I think um, an online presence is something that you need to learn about first. Uh, it's something... I see some things and I find them quite base and crude. Um, I don't think it's some... I don't think it's a place where you need to sell yourself that much. I think it's important to be thankful for certain things. And going back to what was talking about press, you know, a lot of press now is done online. If you've got certain shows coming, like I've got a, a new series coming out on Sky uh, in the spring, and we were just sent posters and things like that and asked, you know, it's not enforced, but say, would you mind putting this on Twitter? Would you mind putting this on Instagram? And it just starts to build up a buzz. So, yeah, but people I, like that personal touch, don't they? That personal touch from the yeah. actor themselves rather than a yeah. press office. Yeah, yeah they do. Uh, and also, it, it, as we know, you know, the reach now is infinite, you know, because everywhere, it can go everywhere. I mean, I was doing a, a football show for Netflix last year that was period drama but it was all very much based in Lancashire and I have messages from people who have just been watching it in you know Buenos Aires and Barcelona and they, they kind of love it you know so it just goes to show um yeah I think that's I've learned I I, I learned the hard way with Twitter uh I was never really that into it um and it only I've only just sort of you know talking about education and learning I've only been learning about social media for the past three years since the podcast because it's such a good promotional tool i think if you use it as a business tool um it, it can reap rewards there's no way that i would be able to get the guests that i do for the podcast uh without social media not at all because you know people certain people tend to come to me now with guests like i i, I didn't ask nicole kidman to come on her team got a message oh, wow. to me and asked to come on and now normally when uh now when when actors of that status asked to come on i never think it will happen because what i do is i don't change the rules just because it's nicole kidman i say okay right i can't have 20 usually they say well if you've got 20 minutes I went, no it's no good to me this is not the podcast for you go and do something else i said i need at least 45 50 minutes that's the bare minimum i need um i won't really touch on the series or the film that you'll want to promote i'll t i'll speak about it for a few minutes if i've seen it uh it will it can get personal it'll be about past it'll be about failure um it'll be a free form conversation it's not your general sort of press q a um and if that's for you, then that's great. So I did all that, really thinking, yeah, they're gonna come back and just go, no, Nicole won't agree to that. Um, and then they came back like a week later and went, oh, we've spoke to her and she's listened to a bit and she really likes it, she's, she's up for it. I went, oh, right, okay, so this is gonna happen because usually they just go away. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that that things like that would never have happened without social no, media. It, you're obviously doing something right because it's a very crowded marketplace, the podcast marketplace. And of course, you, your podcast won an award. So, so well done on that. So that just shows. Yeah. Were, you surprised, were you surprised when you got the award? Um, yeah, because it was in the first year. Um, and, you know, we've gone on to win a few more after that. And it, it constantly surprises me. I remember, I remember saying to my producer early on, I said, look, I, I, you know, if one person listens, I'd be really pleased. But at the end of the day, I was doing something for me to see if I could hit 40 and not have a midlife crisis and go and have an affair with a model and get caught. When, no, when, I, when do you hit 40? I was in a few years' time, Graham, it's fine. But, you know, I did what any sort of um, white 40-year-old man does uh is start a podcast and see <laughs> you know see if i see if i can add a new string to my bow really is is the thing um so the fact that you know i remember when we hit uh like a million downloads the other year I was, it's just it's gobsmacking but have you got again, yeah sorry no, come on. no but again that goes back to um social media reach because if someone retweets that Nicole Kidman's been on or 
when Reese Shearsmith came on the other week, it, it kind of blows up a bit, and you're going, "Oh, well, why didn't I know about this podcast?" So you've got more listeners. It just it it generates it generates listeners. It's, it's interesting how different actors have different views on online um, um, stuff because uh, Karen Henthorne, I'm presuming you, you know Karen Henthorne, she she was on talking to us recently, and she was telling us how she got a gig, she got a, an acting role by liking somebody's post so um wow. it just it just shows you shows you diff- different for different people um right any more strings to your bow in the future is there anything else you've yet to achieve or any plans for the future what's on the horizon for craig Marcus? oh i don't know i really don't know and i think that's really exciting um i mean i'm possibly um looking into doing a a, a course in psychology um because just to do something. Wow. I know it's just because I'm so interested in in the human aspect, and it's all because of the podcast, you know. And uh, listening and conversing with people has taught me more in three years um, than yeah. It's taught me so so much, not only about myself, but about sort of what I want and what I need. Okay, let's go back to the eighties. Um, filed college, was it? Um, and you've you've been invited to talk to the students as a as a successful actor. And the young Craig Parkinson has a chat with you. What advice would you give to your younger self who's got no idea? He might know what he wants to do, but he's got no idea where the future's going. What would you say to him? Probably um, don't rush right in. Um, it's always important to stand back from the crowd and observe before uh, you open your mouth. I think that's great. And, and it's, it's something you've, you've touched on throughout this chat mm. about observing and not just jumping, jumping in. I so so that's, really, I think it's important. So, so that kind of leads me on to, I was going to say, do you have any regrets, but I'm guessing if you're always observing, You've not, you've you've not really made any big four parts, or have you? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you. See, I mean, just going back to um, social media. I mean, I was a few, fair few years ago. Um, I, I was doing a a television series, and it was a it was a very very unhappy shoot for a lot of reasons. Um, but but it, it it almost made me stop acting. It was that bad. I really really it really wow. upset me to my core. Um, and I was on Twitter very occasionally, and somebody had asked about this series, and I was very naive. I didn't understand how Twitter worked at that point, so I thought it was a private. I thought they were just texting me, but I said something about <laughs> I said something derogatory about the show, um, which was very, you know, off the cuff. It wasn't detailed. It was just, you know, I won't bother, but it's, I'm sure it'll be a load of shit or some or, or words to that effect. It, it, look, it was not good, not good. And, and it's funny because at the time I was waiting on a big job that was going to be filming in America and it was with my old agent. Uh, and then on a Saturday morning, my phone goes and it's my agent and I'm going, oh my God, it must be about the, the American job. And why would he be ringing me on a Saturday? Bearing in mind that this, this Twitter exchange happened late on the Friday night, which I didn't mm. think about. because I, you know. um, And he just said, whatever you've put on Twitter now, take it down because the oh. production company, I'm really not happy with you. And I went, oh God. So yeah, look, I've made we all make mistakes but it's failure is key it's you learn from it oh absolutely i mean it's you know it's not an old wives tale it's just truth absolutely fail 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 exactly yeah i think um my my only thing to add to that is never go online on social media when you're drunk that's probably a a good idea as well (laughs) yeah i would i would say that's right up there yeah. Okay, just, just to wrap it up, um, particularly for our theatre students, uh, and a lot of them 
actually do want to go and work in theatre. Yeah. Um, and that's not just on the stage, but behind the, the scenes as well. Have you got any tips and advice uh, for those people before we, before we wrap it up? Well, at the moment, uh, pray. Pray that theatre and live performance uh, come back soon um, because depending on where you are and what tier system you're in at the moment, there's, you know, there's places in the north that are struggling and they've laid a lot of people off. A lot of people's livelihood are all gone. This, this is all information we all know. Um, mm. I don't know. I really don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think theatre as we know it is going to come back for quite some time. Um, because you've got to think, I, I sometimes think about the age of my parents and say you're, you're in the West End or you're at the National or you're anywhere in the country. Midweek on a Wednesday, uh, there's a certain uh, demographic of people that will come to the theatre and they're, they've been looking forward, looking forward to it for ages. It's been on the calendar in the kitchen and they're of a certain age. Those people help support theatre across the board they're not going to come back into theatre anytime soon. Um, you're certainly not until these vaccines are getting rolled out because they're not going to feel safe. They're not going to want to sit in a room, regardless of, of social distance. They're not going to want to sit, certainly not next to someone they don't know. It's like for the sake of an afternoon's entertainment. So they're the, they're the beating heart. They're the, the people that are supporting the theatre industry. Uh, and they ain't coming back yet. Um, so get as many strings to your bows as possible because you know you may be the most talented set designer um but your skills are not going to be needed at the moment and that's really sad and it's a real shame and, and i've got a lot of um not only in you know behind the behind the scenes and actors certain actor friends who have never been in front of a camera they've never done television or film because their soul livelihood is theatre you know they'll do a season mm. at the national and they'll go from play to play to play or they'll go and do six months at the rsc that's what they do that is their livelihood and that's gone it's just mm. gone like that and it, you know breaks my heart yeah well let's let's hope um this vaccine helps and we can get back to normal because a lot a lot of my students want to work in community theatre which have uh, of course been hit hard as well yeah. but listen craig Thank you very much for, for joining us. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. And um, I think the students will have as well. So good luck for the future. And oh, you thank too. you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Sorry, I do tend to talk quite a lot. But um, no, that's what we want. That's what we want. Know, I, and it I, shuts I, me up as well for a while. So. <laughs> Look, Graham, thanks so much, everybody. And uh, I hope you all um, keep safe and take care.